Alrighty, so we're at the Maritime Museum. This is the Maritime Museum. This is Vancouver Waterfront here. Really, really cool place. There's a submarine here. So this is the submarine that I was telling you guys about that we're gonna go look at. So this is the PX-15, otherwise known as the Ben Franklin. It was named after Ben Franklin because he was the guy that discovered uh, the Gulf Stream, which is what this sub was made for mapping. So Jacques Picard, who was a Swiss oceanographer and engineer, he designed this submarine and they used it for oceanographic research. It was battery powered, lead batteries. So the thrusters, which is what those are, were powered by lead batteries. They went from Florida to Maine, studying the Gulf Stream. It had a max depth of 4,000 feet and an operational depth of 900 to 2,000 feet. Jacques Picard also took part in the Trieste Challenger expedition. The Ben Franklin. It was built by Grumman Aerospace in Switzerland and then it was disassembled and reassembled in Florida. It was a NASA project, US military and NASA. And NASA sent a scientist on board to observe the long-term effects of being in an enclosed space for 30 days, right? It was the longest, one of the longest missions, continuous underwater missions ever undertaken. And NASA used the results to study how people would cope in space with being sealed in a capsule for 30 days. It was a pretty revolutionary project at the time. And NASA still uses that data to this day. And they, it was really good. They, they were also looking at the electromagnetics of the earth, transmission of light through water, right? So diffusion, all kinds of stuff. US military was also using it as a way to judge their security. So they were gonna see the likelihood of their defense system being interrupted by a underwater, a subsea object. So they were using this as a control to kind of test how efficient it was. Six guys, 30 days, and then it stopped in service, right? Okay, this is the, the, it's 130 ton, the Ben Franklin PX-15, seven men hailing from three countries, Switzerland, United Kingdom, and the United States, the Gulf Stream Drift Mission, a 30 day underwater voyage. And this was actually before, it was 69, the mission was launched, it was before the Apollo mission but it was kind of overshadowed by the Apollo mission, right? Because it says here, the vessel was piloted from a control console incorporating the state-of-the-art Apollo technology pioneered by Grumman, a company heavily involved in American aerospace. Four 25 horsepower AC motors propelled the sub when it was not drifting. They're all rotatable, providing high maneuverability and steel shot would be released. Those are balls of steel, basically ballast, ballast balls of steel, steel shot. And if they release the shot, that would bring them up to the surface. Yeah, it laid derelict for a lot of years, right? And then in the 90s, they got to restore it. It's crushed up is 4,000 feet, 50 feet long, inch and a half, inch and three quarter steel, 29 viewing ports, hot water tanks. They had 378 battery cells. There was a laboratory, bunks, galley, and a ward room. And the, it should be said that they weren't running under power the whole time, they were drifting. They were using the, the Gulf Stream to drift and then they would use the battery powered thrusters whenever they needed to maneuver, but it was mostly drift. They were studying the drift of the Gulf Stream from Florida to Maine. And obviously Ben Franklin, he was the guy that discovered it. That's why it's named after him. And like I said, it was a few days before the Apollo mission. So it kind of got overshadowed by the Apollo mission, but NASA was working with um, Picard and the US military to get this thing going. And it was huge for the US military because they were all about national security because they wanted to see if subs could invade US waters without them knowing. So they were using this as a kind of as a, you know, a test, right? See if the US military could detect them. One of the longest, like I said, one of the longest continuously underwater missions ever. Long time ago, right? But it's at the Vancouver Maritime Museum. If you guys want to come see it, it's pretty cool. Especially after that Ocean Gate thing. This is how you do it properly. Okay, so there's a boiler over here. Good example of a ship boiler, right? You see the tubes, the holes, right? The perforations for the boiler. The night she was wrecked, it was dark about 1 a.m. in the morning. The captain hugged the shore pretty tight to get past the eddy. And it was 1969, salvaged from the SS Beaver. In 1836, to trade with the native communities. So it's a ship boiler, makes steam or heats water to produce steam. We got a cannon, right? Everybody loves cannons, right? Americans and British.
rum running. Oh, this is all the rum running through the island. The wheel? Pirate ships? Hopefully we can see the pirate ship. Ooh, Lorenz Lonsdale. That's after Lonsdale Key. Oh yeah, the rum running. So I didn't realize we had such a big rum running. It makes sense. Yeah, the right. prohibition, but... Crime and run running pirates. These are the guys. Ready there. Wow, that's cool. I didn't know that. There would be pirates. Oh, it's a radio from the 20s. That's really cool. different pirate flags. The pirate's code of conduct. Surprising they even had a code of conduct. That's a port light. Because it's red, right? That's how you know it's port. Port starboard. Starboard would be green. Port would be left. Left hand side of the boat facing the bow. So that's a port light. The lighthouse light. Point Atkinson. Oh, they got the dredge and the HMS. The Union Steamship Company. So yeah, these guys, that was like going up to Stewart, up all the way up the coast, like what we did on the ferry there. That's what back in the day, it was it's BC Ferries now, but it would have been the Union Steamship Company, right? Whereas that's the vessel. Cardina, that was the vessel, right? Twin Screw. Yeah, well before highways, this was the highway. It was formed in 1899. And it ran from 1899 to 59, 1959. It operated 53 coastal steamers along the coast. And there's exhibits of them, right? Between, operated between Vancouver and the Alaskan Panhandle. The Venture. Right, they're model boats, right? Everybody, we've all seen models. But it's still cool. But yeah, you can come here and look at them in detail. Searchlight from Sudbury. Oh, it's a searchlight. Yeah, from Sudbury 2 for the boat. This would be the searchlight. how they tow scows. Scows and dredges, right? So they tow everything with the rigging. Initiator buoy, a search buoy. That's a pike pole. This thing. Yeah, yeah, the pike pole. That's what they use for grabbing things out of the water, right? The logs, pike pole. Towing hauser. Oh yeah. The inside of the ship. This would be your throttle for both engines, right? Throttle for one one engine each side. What do they got here? Water, fuel, gear, RPM. They got the compass, right? Radios, marine VHFs, not normal VHFs. Those would be marine VHFs. See Vancouver, right? Come on the water in Vancouver. Really cool. Here's the wheel, right? That's where all the magic happens, right here. Very hazardous job, tugboating. Very easy to die. Fall between two barges as they're moving and that's it. Okay, so this is the diving section. Divers, very important. So let's go. So this is the hat, Morse diving hat. So this is, you have a breastplate here. These seal, or these thread onto the breastplate studs, right? And then this forms a seal. And the reason you want weighted boots, right? You see how they got shoes, right? And they have weights. So when you dive in these old, uh, these old canvas suits with these old hats, because you just have a breastplate here that's like nut tight, basically, these wing nuts, those wing nuts are threaded down tight and they form a seal against that gasket. But if you were to flip upside down in this suit, all the water would pour in and you'd basically drown, right? This would be the key for the wing nuts, right? To tighten the wing nuts. You've got exhaust valves. Right, exhaust ports, side port. That's where the air comes in. 
that valve there, that's where the air comes in. Canvas suit, and it's very, very heavy, guys. Like, that helmet by itself is like 70-some pounds. Then you've got your lead weights, your weight belt, your boots, your tools, your umbilical, everything else. So salvage, right? That's what a lot of salvaging ships, a lot of divers do that. First woman to dive. When you're diving, you need air. This is a bellows, otherwise known as a pump. They, in 1797, they used a bellows to send air directly to a diver. Although the pressure could only reach a few meters in depth. And you can see the signals. One pull, more air. Two pulls, less air. Three pulls is slack and four poles is haul. Nowadays, you'd pull on the line, right, if you lose comms. But here, this is just for how much air they want. You can see where the air would come out. The air intake. And the helmet, there's a thread here. The helmet threads onto the breastplate. The porthole can open as well. You've got the exhaust valve back there. So, but can you imagine running a bellows? down the, oh, there's like, you got a guy down there and you got to run a bellows all day. This is the weighted boots, right? The lead boots, because like I said, if your feet aren't weighted and you flip upside down, you could potentially drown. Well, you will drown, the water will just come in and that'll be it, right? This is the comms, right? I was speaking about comms. They have a hat liner and then they got comms, right? Comm wire, usually t two wire comms. Speaker box or the rack box. The pulley system, yeah, this is the pump that they used to use. C.B. Gorman, that's another manufacturer of subsea equipment. They make nice hats too. You can see feet of salt water, right? This is called a pneumo fathometer. It's a pneumo. So they gauge the depth. So what they'll do is they'll have a hose and they'll shoot air down the hose and then the air comes out at depth and whatever resistance that air has to the water depth tells you what depth you're at. So this needle will basically like, I'll say, give me, give me air or whatever, pneumo me, and then the pneumo and then the air comes up and it'll ping and then it'll come back and it sets itself at a depth, right? So, but this compressor, this is how they would have back in the day, this handle here, this is how they would have pumped air down to the guys, right? So I showed you the bellows there. That was the foot pump from like the 1700s. This was the next, uh, the next invention. This was the pulley system. Okay, so pulley system, right? So the guys stopped giving you air that was it. This is where the air comes out too, right? Two gauges, right? Two divers set up. But just imagine pumping this. Like, you literally would have had to pump this all day. If the guy went on a four-hour dive, you'd have to have a guy standing here just pumping the whole time, right? Binoculars. You can also meter your exhaust as well, how much exhaust you want coming out of the hat. Because they would set their buoyancy with these suits, right? So you have air. It comes into the hat, right? The air comes into the hat and it fills up the whole suit, and then your air exhausts out the side. So what they would do to control their buoyancy, because if, you just, if your exhaust valve is fully open, your suit might not fill properly, and you're just gonna sink to the bottom. So there's a little valve on the back, you can see it's got a little, like a, a side thread that you can use. If you wind that in, you won't be exhausting as much air, which means more air stays in your suit, which means you become more buoyant. So that's how these guys controlled their buoyancy with these suits, was there was an exhaust valve on the back of the helmet. And that exhaust valve, depending on how much air you were exhausting, would keep air in your suit or let air out of your suit as you needed it. So that's how they would have controlled their buoyancy, right? We call that buoyancy. So you can see compressor, umbilicals, right? Those are called umbilicals. These are lifelines because you don't want to pull on the air hose because Buddy's air is connected to his helmet. So they have something called a lifeline, which is a rope, basically. And you can pull the guy out, worst case scenario, right? And that's what the line pulls, the pulley system. That's what they're using, right? You're not pulling on your air hose. You don't pull on your air hose. You pull on the wire or the rope. There's, so there's the radio. There's the compressor. There's the air line. Climbing down the ladder into the water. You see how the suit, see how the suit's like inflated a lot? These hooks here, that's where they tie off. That's where that wood rope, right? There's a picture of it here. You can see right there, they've got the lifelines tied off. It's come quite a, quite a long ways, but like I said here, right? The exhaust valve, see how if I wind that out or wind it in, it changes the amount of air coming out of the helmet, which is just the buoyancy. And this is the rack box. That's the communications and there'll be comms inside the helmet. Okay, let's get the ship on film here. So we did all the diving equipment, we did the, various types of boat equipment and rigging and 
everything else, right? Seat again. You can see the prop, right? The screw, as they say, with the rudder. Pretty self-explanatory. The cradle for the ship, right? You can see that. Nice wooden hull. Sail ship, right? Sailboat. A sextant and a spyglass. That's the mast. See all the ropes. Winches for the anchors. We finished up the Maritime Museum. We saw some pirate ships, some submarines, um, some cannons, and some diving equipment. So that was really cool.